Okay, um, now measures of dispersion, which is like spread. How spread out are the data? We got to dive a little bit deeper here. We're going to talk about a, um, a statistic called the range, the variance, and standard deviation. Uh, and this, if you've never heard of these, um, it's going to require some heavy thought, and you may need to pause and rewind and look at this part again. Uh, and then we're going to look at something called the empirical rule when we have that symmetric like bell-shaped distribution. So I have some just theoretical sets of exam scores. Um, if we look at these two and we look at the lowest and highest observation, there are clearly some differences. Um, looking at their distribution shape, they look very similar. The mean is almost the same. The median is the same. Uh, but the first one looks a little more spread out. And if you look at that lowest and highest observation, it goes from 48 to 99. So the range, the range in statistics is an actual number. It's the highest minus the lowest. So the range would be 51. For the second one, the range would only be 33. So we would say the first set has a much larger dispersion. It's more spread out than the second set. Unfortunately, the range doesn't always work. So here's another set of exam scores, two different kind of just made up sets of exam scores. Um, if you look at the range, it's 47 on both of them. But clearly, clearly that second one on the right is more condensed. And so we want to find a way to numerically quantify that somehow. And so we need more than just the range. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to develop this idea of the variance and standard deviation. They're going to require a little machinery and hopefully you can understand where these formulas come from instead of me just, I, I don't really like to, here's a formula, memorize a formula. I want you to know where they come from. So I have some completion rates uh, among a sample of area community colleges. Not a random sample because I put us in it and some of our competitor, not competitors, but peers, Harper, or COD. Uh, and these are the students that come in and complete a certificate or degree within three years. Uh, the average is about 21, 21.2%. Um, so if you think about that and just try to visualize what's going on, put the 21.2% in the middle. COD is below, ECC is above, uh, Harper, Kishwaukee, Rock Valley. And so we have some below, some above, and we have these differences, 7.2, 5.8, we're going to try to use them somehow to, to describe a, a typical, like on average, or you know, how far is a typical local community college, how far do they vary from that mean? How spread out are these uh, completion rates? So uh, I'm going to do a little visual here. So ignoring the, the colleges, we've just got the numbers here. Um, one obvious choice is just to average them. The problem is if you average them, you will always get zero because the mean is kind of that balance point, and so they're balanced on either side, so the average is always going to be zero, the mean. Um, if that doesn't work, another obvious alternative then would be to just look at the numbers, the, the values. So you could look at that absolute difference, the average absolute difference from the mean. Uh, and so in this case, we get about 5.4. This is a t completely reasonable statistic for spread. Unfortunately, um, higher level analysis of it, trying to judge if two of these are different, um, is very, very difficult because of this absolute value. Uh, if you've ever had a calculus class, you may know that dealing with absolute values, they're complicated when you deal with this higher level math. And so, while this would be great to just do absolute difference, and I've seen it reported, it's certainly appropriate to report it. Um, it's often not sufficient for our purposes. So we need a, another option that's similar that would also describe kind of the typical spread. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this a little more visual. And for each of these, what we're going to do is we're going to make a square. So we have the negative 7.2, we're going to make a square and do its area, 51.84. Uh, and then ECCs, we're going to square at 5.8, and square the 6.2, square the 3.8, square the 3.8, and find kind of the average square. So if we add these all up and get the average square, that's 30.64. That doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> what does an average square mean here? So what would be better then 
would be to look at just the side because that's where these 5.8, 7.2, 6.2, those were the average sides. And so what we can do is just take the square root of that and you get about 5.5. So what these are, these are new statistics. So the average square is called the variance and the average side length is called the standard deviation. Uh, and they're based on this idea here of the squares. So here's the formulas. Not quite as fun as the visuals. Um, what we have here, let me see if I can get the mouse. So this sigma, this is like the Greek letter S. Sigma squared is, is the variance for the population. This, this um, That's a lowercase sigma. This is a capital sigma. This means sum. Add them all up. And you take the difference between the value and the mean and then square it. So that's how far away is it? If we go back, how far away is it from the mean? And then square it. So that's what that part of the calculation is. How far away is it from the mean? Square it. And then add all those up and then divide by how many there are. Uh, and then if we take the square root of that, we get what we call the standard deviation. Now you may notice there's an n minus 1 here. Uh, whereas, so for the population we divide by n, for the sample we divide by n minus 1. Uh, I think, I, did I put a note here? No, I didn't. So, um, why n minus 1? <laughs> it's kind of like when your kids ask you, or at least when my kids ask me, you know, why can't we do this and that? And, well, it's complicated. <laughs> it's, you'll learn more when you grow up. Uh, unfortunately, there's no easy answer here. Basically, um, for a sample statistic, you want your sample statistic to estimate the population parameter. So if we have a sample of, say, these five, um, well, that's not a good example. So say we have a sample of ECC students, we find, want to find the sample standard deviation of the hours they work per week. Um, if we have a smallish sample, like 20, and we divide by the sample size, 20, we will consistently underestimate the actual population standard deviation. Um, the theory behind it, I had to take a graduate statistics class to get the theory behind it. So unfortunately, we can't get into that. But basically, we, we're, we would consistently underestimate the actual um, proportion or um, standard deviation. So we divide by one less than the sample size. So I don't know if that's satisfying, but that's why that's basically why that n minus one is there. All right, one last thing with the um, dispersion. If you have this is really interesting fact. If you have a bell-shaped distribution, symmetric, nice and bell-shaped, evenly on both sides, they follow this pattern with the number of standard deviations. So if you go with the mean and go one standard deviation each way. Um, about 68% will be within one standard deviation. 95% will be within two standard deviations. And then basically everyone, 99.7%, basically everyone will be within three standard deviations. Now this is only for bell-shaped. And this is approximate because not any, not any, there's nothing that's perfectly bell-shaped like this. Um, and so these are just approximates. But uh, interesting fact, the empirical rule.